And welcome everyone to Rock M Radio. This is the beginning of a brand new episode of Dive Cuts. Uh, here we are, season seven, uh, officially seventh season. Um, all that's left to believe is a movie. Uh, and we're just getting started on season seven. So, uh, of course, Matt and I are here to talk all about your Missouri Tigers. I am your host, Sam Snelling. Uh, the guy talking, if you're watching, um, I'm on the left. On the right, all the way, beamed via the internet from Indianapolis, Indiana, Matthew J. Harris. Matt, how are you? Uh, I'm fine. Uh, this evening, have not been as productive uh, on the podcast in front as you have. I think this is going to be your fourth one in the span of a week. So More to come, uh, more to come. Uh <laughs> committed to this bit. Uh, happy for you. Um just doing what I can to occasionally pop in and assist you in that effort. Well, we do actually, I mean, we actually have news considering that uh middle of August is not normally a time where there is uh college basketball news dropping. Um the big news, of course, is that our 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 friend CJ Moore got Trilly Donovan uh, on the record <laughs> and actually uh, spoke to Trilly. Uh, did you catch up on that article at all? I have not. I haven't seen. I haven't had a chance to read it. I've been preoccupied with other stuff, but uh, it's on the reading list. I'll get to it at some point. Um, well, you're a good but, friend. You you always read anything that CJ puts out, even if it's uh, about KU. Yeah, I do. I, I encourage everyone to read uh, CJ stuff. Uh, CJ is very good. Um, and even I'm when sure it's about will... KU, it's still good. It... <laughs> Look, good basketball writing is good basketball writing. Um, even if uh, the subject matter is not something that you yourself always like or prefer. So uh... this is this is true. Uh, so we are recording. It is uh, Tuesday, August fifteenth. Uh, it has officially been, uh, I don't know, since last Friday, that uh, the big man, Peyton Marshall, uh, all seven foot, 300 pounds of him, committed to your Missouri Tigers. Uh, it has been just overall for Missouri uh, recruiting um, kind of like a pretty tremendous 10 days, uh, whether you followed, follow uh, college basketball, college football, or both. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of our fan, you know, base here that that watches these episodes, uh, that w- pays attention to to college football and uh, and the Missouri Tigers on that end. So Williams, uh, Moneri, and uh, uh, well, they got Moneri, and I think there's predictions coming out that Drake Kilpatrick is going to commit, and uh, it's looking good for Wingo. They lost uh, McClellan, I think, is the the other kid from St. Louis, uh, yeah, the other wide Ohio receiver. State. Ohio State. Uh, but on the basketball tip, because that's why we're here, uh, Peyton Marshall uh, committed. And then at the beginning of the week last week, we had Marcus Allen. You and I already kind of talked about Marcus Allen uh, committing. Now we're here to talk about Peyton Marshall. Uh, Matt, you've been watching some of his film. Um, what can you tell us about this guy? Uh, he's big. We'll just start with that. Uh, (laughs) seven foot, 300 pounds. Um, uh, haven't seen official measurements, but looks like probably like a plus three or four wingspan. So probably adequate length for a guy that size. Um, I think the one thing that will jump out and I think you have to watch him for extended periods is good mobility and kind of short space. Um, you know, he's got good footwork good balance uh, for his size and kind of his build. Um, I think the thing that people are going to, you know, rightly kind of point out is what's he like in a straight line? A little bit uh, of work to do there. Um, But if you're going to just talk about, you know, physical size proportion, clearly ready to show up on campus and just has the frame to kind of, I think, make an impact early. Uh, They're going to have to shape that frame up a little bit and sculpt it, but um, just on the hoof, He's got positional size. He's got good strength, good balance. A lot of things that I think, you know, you want to see in a big hiss, you know, in kind of a back to the basket kind of big. And he's a throwback in that way, too. I think um, 
you know, we've always talked about at least in the last couple of years about how big men are going extinct. Um, Peyton's a true throwback in that sense. Uh, well, they're very, going very much... extinct, but the college game still has a lot of traditional yeah. big men, and they're staying power within college basketball because yeah. of the lack of opportunity at, at the NBA level. Uh, and that was where I was going. Growing. Yeah, that's where I was going. You know, he's yeah. a guy that, you know, if you look at stylistically at the college level, projects as a three or four year guy. Um, even if you, even if he plays well, you know, he, I think he's a guy just with the nature and the structure of the game now is probably a three or four year guy. Um, otherwise, I, I think, you know, he is kind of what he looks like on the surface. He's a guy who's comfortable playing with his back to the basket, probably more so on the right block than anywhere else. Um, nearly 70% of his touches were post-ups in the games I watched. Probably about half of those post-ups were on the right block. Uh, wants to get to the baseline side uh, with a drop step, or he wants to play over his left shoulder. Very left, very dominant, not unsurprising. A lot of bigs, if you are his size, you can get to your spot easily. You're going to finish in a way that's comfortable for you. That's predominantly over his left shoulder. Uh, can pass it. Can make passing reads off the post. I think, um, at least at this stage, maybe the passing component's been oversold a little bit. At least if you break down you know, the assist to turnover rate numbers, um, it's about twice as many turnovers per to assists, but has shown that he can make good passing reads off the post. So I think, you know, on, you know, just sort of its face, he's a, he's a guy who can, you know, has positional size, you know, has two or three post moves that he's comfortable making, can execute them efficiently and shows potential as a passer. Um, from there, it's going to come down to development, but there are worse things you can have than, than those sort of traits in a more traditional big. And uh, last thing is just, he's a, he's a contrast to what we sort of have expected from Dennis Gates in terms of pursuing big men, which has been mostly perimeter oriented, a little bit more skilled in terms of playing as connectors or facing up. So there's that to keep in mind too. He is a, a stark contrast to a guy like Jordan Butler, who's on the roster right now. Yeah. So uh, kind of moving into uh, that part of it, I think this is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, we were a little sort of surprised that, you know, they were pursuing him as heavily as they were considering that he is a little bit more of a traditional big, uh, and, and Dennis so far, uh, has been very, um, open about his desire to play five out, to shoot a lot of threes, uh, to play very, you know, a very modern style of offense. Uh, so how do we think that, you know, Peyton actually fits into all that? Because, uh, he, he, he doesn't shoot the ball uh, from, you know, outside of a few feet very often. Um, I mean, he does have soft hands. He has, you know, good feet. Uh, and I think when you're talking about, you know, somebody who could maybe develop those skills, you know, he certainly has those things. You know, how accurate of a three-point shooter he might become uh, is certainly a mystery. Uh, but it is a, a little bit of a, a contrast, like you said, to what we've sort of come to expect for what they're seeking. Um, so how does he fit in? I, I think the one thing I would say is when I've watched him, he's played, you know, Kel, his high school will play four out around him. Uh, he's used to playing in a spaced environment with a lot of shooters. Um, I think to a certain extent he can, you know, provide – kind of a good contrast of gravity on the interior. If you've got perimeter shooting, it will make it harder for defenses to dig down, you know, particularly guard off the wing, or if you're going to try and send maybe help from the baseline side, if that's a guard that's having to come make that decision and you've got legitimate floor space around him, he can get the ball back to a shooter pretty quickly. He is pretty decisive about passing behind help. So I think that's one thing that he can do that he can fit there is, you know, if you're going to use him as sort of a counterweight to what teams want to do in terms of, you know, hugging up against shooters, uh, he can be a contrast to that. I do think, you know, if he gets on campus and he goes through conditioning and he's able to sculpt his frame a little bit, I think his footwork's good enough to where he can become a competent roller to where you could have him, you know, screen, roll, clear, like a double gap for a driver. And he could roll into a post-up. He loves to duck in. That's one of his things. If he's not going to get on the right block, 
he's comfortable ducking in and playing in a post pin, comfortable, you know, getting to a drop step. He can show going over both shoulders. So I think you could use him in some screening action there to roll him into some post ups and maybe, you know, create some double gaps for a driver. Um, maybe in time he becomes a pick and pop option for you. I think the real linchpin is going to be, can he, you know, evolve into a guy that Missouri uses at the elbow and at the point, you know, if you see where Missouri enters the ball sometimes to a Noah Carter, either at the top of the key or at the elbow and then makes passing reads off of that. If he can get there, he becomes a guy that you can now facilitate in those situations. He can now pass the ball. You know, he's got, you know, you'll have to clean up his decision making there, but if he can become a passer in those situations, if you can use him, you know, off the block to exploit shooting gravity and you can roll him into post-ups, you can find some different uses for him. I think the one thing we're going to talk about a lot is, you know, how much time is he going to need? I don't think, you know, he necessarily has to be a three-point shooter. He just has to be a guy who can evolve into a good connector and who can, you know, find ways to get to post-ups that are advantageous for him. Missouri throws the ball into the post, you know, early, you know, in early clock situations, if a guy beats down the floor, gets a cross match, they'll punch the ball in. So there are opportunities for him, you know, once the conditioning and once strength and conditioning work kicks in, you know, to find little pieces where his game fits in. So I think, you know, again, there's time on his side here. He's not a finished product. He's got 10 months before he shows up to campus. But I think if you really sit down and you think about it, there are ways that he can fit into different aspects of what Missouri does. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's worth pointing out that for all the, you know, the five out talk and all the three point shooting talk, Missouri did post uh, the ball up uh, quite a bit with, with Kobe and and with Noah uh, and with, uh, with Dre Golston too. I mean, I, I think there was, uh, you know, for a roster that really lacked size last year, uh, they still took opportunities if, if, you know, if the, the matchups were right to, to, you know, post somebody up. And, and I think like you kind of mentioned like decision-making and that's one of the areas where, uh, you know, like if you, and you've kind of crunched a lot of the numbers here, uh, but the, you know, the numbers don't look super friendly for Marshall just yet. Um, you know, but I do think it is one of those things that it just becomes uh, a reps thing and an understanding of, uh, you know, the flow of the offense and, and when, and this is all kind of comes back to coaching is like, okay, so if, if a double or a, a dig is coming from one area, where are you looking and, and where are your cutters and where are your spacers? Uh, and I, so I think a lot of those things can come. Um, I don't think Missouri is ever going to be a, uh, a slow paced, you know, post offense, you know, the way that, yeah, you know, like, like Purdue is always, you know, looking to kind of get Zach Eady the ball or, or, you know, like, you know, Michigan working to get yeah. Hunter Dickens in the ball. Um, or even Illinois with Kofi. I don't think. Yeah. Happen. Like, I, I don't, I don't know that that's uh, necessarily, you know, going to be the fit, but I do think it's interesting. Um, you know, like essentially having these two young bigs now, including John, uh, uh, Jordan Butler. Right. Am I yeah. always, I always like do yeah, that. He, always... he, he and his brother just like, Am I getting the right one that's on the roster now? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so like, you know, with, with he and Butler, essentially you have guys with very contrasting styles. Uh, and that is something that I actually really, really like when it comes to, uh, you know, eventually if you're looking to kind of platoon them a bit, because I mean, look, I mean, no, even higher end bigs tend to not really play much more than maybe 25 minutes. Um, you know, so even then, like you're really kind of looking at a platoon like system and, and, you know, what kind of different looks, you know, different styles you're going to get with these two bigs as they kind of grow and mature. Yeah. And I think the one thing that would, you know, I think is probably going to stick out more to me is what are you going to do defensively with him? Um, because right now he, is, you know, the teams that he's played on, have have figured out a way to sort of hack, you know, the idea that you can put him, you can isolate him in space. They will play him kind of as a pure backline anchor, and they'll basically have him work a triangle between, you know, each block and at the top of the restricted area. 
if he does get pulled into a ball screen, it's deep drop coverage. It's more than two steps off. And he understands how to position himself and move to create a pull-up. He's not going to be a guy that I, I didn't see a lot on tape. I think I only counted two possessions where he played in a hard hedge. And in both instances, we had to recover back. A bucket was given up. So I think that's going to be the thing is, you know, what do you do with him defensively, you know, to understand that, you know, if you want to be an aggressive defense that's trying to force turnovers and get in transition, but you have a guy that at least right now can get caught out a little bit. How do you mitigate that? But I think he understands, you know, at least when I watch him on tape, sort of how to play in isolations. So he understands how to use his body, how to position, how to get himself set up to use his length. You know, there are drivers that, you know, are quicker than him, but he understands how to give ground. He understands how to turn a driver and make them have to, you know, finish against his length. I think the one thing that's going to be interesting is what he does in ball screen defense. Do you have to change some coverages when he's on the floor? Are you having to, you know, preload the defense a little bit more and kind of shift more towards the midline and get more into gaps? But this coaching staff has shown that it can come up with hacks. It did it with the one three one at times last year to mitigate stuff, you know, they're going to have to maybe do that with him a little bit early on. But I think once the conditioning rounds into shape and rounds into form, again, I think his mobility and his feet are good enough that he can, you know, be competent playing a little bit farther up and drop coverage. And maybe you could get him in situations where you trap. But I think that's, you know, people are going to focus on the offensive fit. To me, defensively, I think that's where you're going to have to maybe get a little bit more creative early on and, you know, figure some things out. But as he goes, you know, I think they'll, they'll understand what their personnel is, what their lineups are, and, and they'll be able to adjust. Well, so uh, another sort of part of this, I think, is uh, essentially Dennis Gates is at the very least upgrading the overall like recruiting profile at Missouri. Um the last two years, and depending on your service, uh, you know Anthony Robinson, I think, was a low four star in, in some services, but I think most probably had him as like a high three star. We're going to give him another star just to be friendly, uh, but that would essentially mean that uh, Dennis Gates has secured commitments or signings from six different four stars in the last two years. If you want to throw in Aiden Shaw, uh, you know which you know, half credit. Yeah, you give him a half credit for there. So it was it's six and a half uh four stars uh four star kids uh and you know potentially more on the way i mean we don't really know if this is the end of the class if uh if you know i think obviously there are guys that they would continue to add if they could um but at the very least like that the the you know the talent base of the roster is sort of starting to look a lot more like a florida state roster than then even maybe we expected after uh, after the wake things kind of went, you know, last year with how he was adding guys through the portal. Yeah, I think it'll be a question as to are they eventually going to shift towards using the portal more to backfill rotational spots? And, you know, if they have a guy that goes pro, are they you know, going to anticipate it and say, okay, we got to go and get a higher end guy? I'm going to be fascinated, you know, what role – the portal plays for them, especially like we've said over the last couple of weeks, as the COVID years begin to you know wane for guys, and if the NCAA is limiting second waivers, you know, or waivers for second transfers, is the you know kind of glut of talent that we've seen over the last couple of years going to you know dwindle a little bit, and it's going to put maybe a little bit more of a renewed emphasis back on high school recruiting. We'll see how that goes. I think what stands out to me about what this staff has done so far, I looked at it earlier today. You know, if you leave out the 2025 kids who are set to visit, I think Missouri's hosted 17 official visitors in 2023, 24, and 24. None of them have rated outside the top 150 of the composite. Like they've, they are, even if you include the four 2025 kids that have officially booked visits, 20 out of the 21 will be top 150 kids. That is um, exceptionally good, you know, you know, given, you know, what happened the last couple of years of Zoe's tenure, you know, where I think Missouri was starting to work down more towards 100 to one, 100 to 250 of the composite. They were really 
looking at developmental guys that were you were not going to really expect a big jump probably until their junior year. These are guys now that they're recruiting that if you develop them right, you could expect maybe a, a pretty healthy sophomore jump. They've, you know, even if those guys aren't instant impact ones, you've really compressed the developmental timeline for these guys. So I think that that's impressive. They've, you know, I think what's stood out to and we wrote about this last fall is they've also dramatically expanded the board. I don't think you can say it any other way. It's a complete 180 from how Conzo Martin's staff managed the board. They're at 54 offers in 2024, and they're at 36 in 2025. And they're already up to 12 or 13 in 2026 and three in 2027. They have... They're just spraying offers everywhere. Um, they do not wait to use an offer as a bargaining chip. They, you know, you can tell when you break it down geographically, they're working kind of regionally, but they will, you know, go out and they will, you know, use an offer as an entree to get in with a nat- with national guys. They, you know, I think the last staff was really selective in when they offered top 50 guys. The staff is not. They will offer 10 or 15 top 50 guys in a class and they'll see if they can get traction with them. Um, so it's, it's been distinct. They're recruiting at a high level right now. Um, if they closed out this class with four guys, they would have two openings left for spring and they'd potentially be tracking towards needing a four man class very loosely in 2025. All the needs for that 2025 class align with, the four visitors they have set up right now. You can very clearly see a change in sort of, you know, tactics and in terms of how they're structuring it. So it, it's, again, they've got to execute the plan, but so far I don't think anyone could really say they've done anything other than meet or exceed expectations out of the shoot. Yeah, I think it is going to be something that we're going to have to track and not just, you know, for Missouri, but for a lot of college basketball, uh, and to see sort of like how different coaches are approaching, you know, the, the shift of, you know, the basically players getting younger because, you know, there's been this real hard push to, you know, get these good college players and guys who are able to, you know, stay for a fifth and sixth year to, to, to use that year, um, you know, and, and use it in college. And, and so once that does run out, um, you know, and I, I, I think you can kind of see stylistically, you know, Dennis Gates has always kind of wanted to have a deep roster. Like he wants to be able to play a lot of guys culture wise. Uh, you know, he wants to bring guys in who are going to develop and, and, and give them, you know, time to develop the, the bridge here over the next few years is going to be interesting for me to watch yeah. because uh, you know, at some point I think he, he is going to want to recruit, uh, you know, the the guys who are uh, difference makers and, and bring them on as as high school fresh or high school uh, age players in their freshman year, um, you know, versus like plucking a lot of those guys out of the portal or uh, you know really kind of using your roster transitionally, which you know I think I think a lot of coaches are, have almost made a little bit of a, a, an overcorrection for, you know, this, uh, this move away over like the last few years. And, and, and so I do think it'll stabilize. Um, my, I mean, my opinion is that, you know, it does seem like this staff at least seems pretty unafraid of yeah. going, uh, you know, and getting young guys and being able to, you know, play young guys early. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people were, uh, you know, anticipating this season, you know, going back and, and being, you know, pretty experienced, but, you know, it, it does seem like we are going to see at least some doses of Trent Pierce and, uh, you know, and Jordan Butler and, and hopefully even Ann Robinson is, is yeah. he's able to kind of, you know, get used to things and, and step in. I, you know, I think that level of development is going to, or, you know, isn't going to, but could potentially, uh, you know, be sort of like a difference maker for the staff and the program over the, like the next, you know, three to four years. Yeah. The, to your point, if, you know, T.O. Barrett shows up next year, will be uh, as a freshman, Ant Robinson will be in his first year, potentially as 
assuming the development goes along the path and the track they want it to, we'll be inheriting more minutes there. Do you go into the portal and do you go to a really good mid-major point guard and say, we want you to come in and use your last year with us? You know, they've been really good, I think, at identifying mid-major guys who are going to be okay with jumping up a level and with that going to be okay buying into more of that kind of collective concept. I think, can they find a veteran point guard who can, you know, fill in some minutes there and, you know, kind of backfill if they need a steady hand. The same goes for the post. If you're going to begin to scale up Jordan Butler's minutes, you've got Peyton Marshall coming in who you know may need some time. Do you go get a guy who can give you 10 to 12 to 13 minutes a game again just to ease and provide a buffer there? Do you start using the portal for that type of situation and you're offering those guys the opportunity you know, on certain nights to play more, you know, as matchups dictate and as, you know, scouting reports dictate. If you get to that point where development is consistent enough and you're just recognizing, okay, we need someone that can come in and just if we need it, steady the ship a little bit. I, I think that's what's going to be interesting. I think that's eventually where you'd like to see, you know, this, you know, roster get to. And if they have, you know, a surprising need pop up, no that they can sell the system and the structure to a guy who may be a little bit more of a luminary and say, Hey, look, there's a clear need here, you know, come right in. We can sell you on. So I think having that clarity on role and what they're going to be able to do is going to help them. So that's, I think in my mind where you'd, you'd want this kind of you know, roster balance to, to evolve to. So uh, I think, the the question then that it's on everybody's mind is sort of how this class uh, is going to wrap up. Um, the big name on you know the tips of everybody's tongue is uh, Honor Batang, who's the sort of borderline uh, high four star, low five star. Um, yeah. Again, depending on your service, but certainly like a top. 30 level kid yeah uh from from arkansas and uh he's even gotten a few sort of crystal bally uh picks for missouri uh before a an upcoming visit so he's planning on visiting uh missouri i think here in about 10 days and has certainly been probably the top target uh out of this class for the staff they've been on him early and then hard and it's whatever they're selling seems to be working um, as you know, at least some people seem to think that Missouri might even be in the lead here. Yeah. I, I think it depends on, you know, you know, the source you get, I think national guys have sort of tipped Missouri as, you know, a dark horse here and carrying some momentum. You know, I think at least from the Arkansas side of the fence, it would be, you know, if they push, if they really blitz, they could get into the deep mix there. But the question I think at least uh, I've read from the Arkansas side is, you know, how expansive does Musk want to get with this 24 class at this point, they took a lot of guys um, in the transfer class. And frankly, Musk is, I think feels more comfortable in his niche with transfers. Um, but if it's been a, a guy like Boateng, the staff at, you know, Fayetteville has made it work and is, you know, sold out. Um, Indiana's kind of been touted as a team that's sort of lurking. Um, They're trying to get him on campus. They've made up some ground. We'll see if they can get him there. Um, LSU sort of floating there. Then I think the rest are sort of just like graph, you know, graphic filler. But um, but Tang is going to be interesting um, in the sense that I think all the other guys we've talked about have all the physical attributes you want for like impact guys in the sec. Um, I don't know if I would tout any of them as a guy who'd come in and make a, a real dent early next year. Honor Tang is the, is not that I think he could walk in and really, I think, you know, become a guy who can become that second or third option on a, on, on a good team. Mm-hmm. Um, the jumper is a little streaky. But the mechanics are just beautiful. It's a beautiful looking shot. It's just a question of reps. Um, when I watched him in July, it was just humming. 
It was coming off clean, repeatable, compact, and it's quick. It's really, really quick, high, really good high shot pocket. Doesn't take long to get into it. Can get into it, you know, coming off a pin down. Usually a one dribble, but he can get into it. But, man, he's strong as all get out. Built just to walk on campus right now and play. If you if you look at him, he could plug him right into the lineup right now. And he'd be physically ready to go. Um, defensively, you know, when he's engaged, he's really, really, really good. Um, but it's all there. Um, high academic kid from a great family. It, if you're looking for a guy that you would want to plug in for next year, it, it's Honor Batang. Um, it, you know, he just edges out Bishop Boswell as my favorite target on the board uh, for this class. He's he's really really good. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm all uh, on board for Batang. He's a little bit more of a, like a true wing than I think, yeah. uh, you know, Boswell's a little bit more of that combo guard. Um, yeah. I would happily take both. Um, I know, it, you know, if you were to get, take both, that would end up being kind of a full five man class. Uh, and I'm skeptical that they would go there. Um, unless it was like a really, really, really high impactful guy. Uh, and I'm thinking more like a you know acquaintance um, yeah. level you know player, um, who you know again we have not had any word or reports that he's you know scheduling anything, um, you know maybe even like Ryan Jones, uh, you know if because at that point I think you're looking a little bit more of like a balance, uh, whereas I think you know. Bishop Boswell, as much as we like him, I think he and he and T.O. Barrett kind of overlap in a lot of ways as far as like, you know, positionally, then you would have essentially two wings, um, you know, with with Marcus Allen kind of being a little bit of like a hybrid wing. And then you have, you know, you you could potentially have like Jones, who's a little bit more of like a true kind of power forwardy type. Um, You know, then you sort of have like that's that's your mix. And it seems a little bit more appropriate then you know like going really heavy on guards uh at least that that would seem to kind of be the move for me yeah i I think the question is how many guards do you think you're going to need this is still a a guard driven sport at the end of the day i I think the one thing that you could feel good about with boswell is that i think you know he could probably tip more to a natural point guard i think his his you know his distribution, his passing reads are a little bit ahead of where T.O. is right now. But I think with both of them, they both guard so well. Like, they're both just dogged on ball defenders. They're really good within a team concept, too, that you'd feel okay because you could at least say to them, you know, hey, look, we're going to find ways to mix you in, you know, as a secondary ball handler and a defender. You know, we'll see. But I, I think the other thing you have to consider is the farther you get away from a visit with Bishop, how much resonance is that going to have, you know, especially, you know, when you consider that wake is still deep in the mix, Tennessee is pushing Xavier is pushing, has a real need for a point guard, you know, Missouri, like you said, has taken TO at that spot. So uh, to me, the focus is, this is just me speaking, nothing, you know, cryptic or anything. The focus would be strictly on honor Botang. A four-man class would be phenomenal. It would be a top ten group if you added Botang to it. If you look at past record, past you know rankings and where scores have been and where Missouri's would be, it would be a top ten class. It would get you a bona fide you know wing score. You get a secondary ball handler, great perimeter defender, you know, two great perimeter defenders in Allen and uh, Barrett, and a developmental big. That's a nice contrast to what you have. And you still have two spots, two to three spots in spring to go out and fill as you feel like you need for the roster to work. So if you've just wrapped up with Botang in like mid September, mid or late September, I, I don't think anyone could look around and say, uh, I feel like there's something missing. I would look at that class and go, they got a lot. They got everything about what they needed to fill out. They got a ball handle. They got a big, they got, and they got two wings, a primary scoring wing and a really, really good defensive wing. I think people could walk away happy with that class. Uh, I would 
certainly be happy with that class. I think Dennis Gates and uh, and CY would certainly be happy. Kyle Smith Peters, uh, Dickie Nutt, mm-hmm. all very mm-hmm. happy with that class. Be thrilled with that class. Uh, you have anything else that you wanted to hit on before we get out here? I think uh, we just wanted to kind of do a quick hitter on this uh, this Marshall stuff. Um, and uh, only I, thing, I, I, yeah, I know we're, the we're still, yeah, we're still waiting on the schedule to come out. We're, we'll wait until the schedule's complete yeah. before we kind of go through and preview some of that. Um, I don't know, uh, under the hood kind of stuff. Uh, I do have uh, another interview coming up. Uh, this week with uh, Evan Miyakawa from evanmia.com. I'm uh, pretty excited about that. Um, and I think uh, there'll be another one next week and another one week after that. And then at some point, like, you know, uh, Matt and I record again. Maybe we'll get the other Matt on too. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Wild Who idea knows? to have that other guy. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, make sure you uh, press that subscribe button. We need all the subs we can get. It does help us spread the good word about Missouri basketball uh, throughout the YouTubery. I'm not really sure if that's the correct word or not, but that's what I'm going with. Um, you can also hit the like button. That does help amplify us as well. If you are listening to this on a podcast, uh, however you listen to your podcasts, then uh, make sure you, you, you are subscribed there. And also, uh, please leave us a rating. Uh, five stars would be great. <laughs> uh, I think the more five-star reviews we get, the better things are. Uh, and you can do that on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store. Uh, you can do the same thing on Spotify, all these places. Um, and then so Matt's going to take probably a week or two off. We'll see, uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, and in the meantime, you'll see uh, my ugly mug here, you know, talking to other people for a while. I like that. That's idea. it. That's it. Get That's, it. That's all we got. Yep. Yeah. Hold you know. up. Because uh, it's going to be a fun season. We got a lot. We got a lot coming up. And uh, also, I think uh, b- before the box score has more reps coming. Yeah, it's things are happening on this old rock and radio station. Matt, always good to talk to you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Rock M Radio, a proud partner of Fans First Sports Network. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to see more just like it beamed directly into your personal device, just click the subscribe button below. Uh, and you can find this podcast through the Apple Podcast app or for iPhone or the Google Podcast app for Android or whatever app you use to listen to your podcast. Uh, we are also available on Spotify. Just search for Rock M Radio. Uh, and if you like other sports, Fans First Sports Network uh, is a podcast network that has uh, coverage of all other teams, Major League Baseball, uh, MLS, uh, NFL, whatever you want uh, to listen and, and read about. It is a great, great network full of really fantastic podcasts. So look them up and subscribe uh, to any and all of those podcasts. Uh, Rock M Radio will be back with more episodes coming soon. Thanks. Thanks.